He has to say. So please welcome Dr. Wang. Yeah, initially, my assignment uh, when Bob talked to me, he said, can I talk about what can we be done or anything can be done when your tumor metastasizes the liver? Then I look at uh, the meeting agenda, didn't see anything talk about the surgical intervention, and I smell someone has been assigned to talk about the liver. So I was smart enough when I prepared my uh, slide, I had reserved a lot of stuff from the surgical point, not just the liver. I think since Marcelo did a very good job this morning, I don't think I need to repeat too much on the liver side other than the surgical part of the treatment. So I'm gonna focus on the uh, disease treatment in general. This is... I want to that one, okay. So since we're talking about the stage four disease in general, and I know many of you guys, the first time when you got diagnosed, they, they tell you you had a tumor in the liver and you all devastated because it's a stage four disease. And the stage four disease in any other cancer translates into a very bad, bad news. And so everyone's freaking out, say, wow, I had a stage four disease. But the way I talk to my patient, I say, when you have a carcinoid tumor or neuroinquant tumor, it's a kind of good news and bad news. The good news is you should not die of the disease. The bad news is you may die with the disease. So in other words, we, our goals, all this group of people we work together, we try to make this condition become a chronic disease, illness like diabetes. You live with it. You should not die of it with good management. But just kind of overall pictures, they what's been transpiring. Like Marianne said, when she was initially diagnosed, there's been not too much treatment. And before a triotype become available, the treatment even even more or less. So when the triotype become available in 1975 and Europe started treating it, that time the only treatment, if you have any disease at all, most of people just wait, they will not do anything. They will tell you, say, this is a slow growing tumor. Just wait and see when your disease become active, we do something. And when I started involved in this, this care of the neuroquine patient, I always think that's a very stupid idea. You don't ignore something or put something off just because it's a small process or slow process. It's a good example, if you see a live cigarette butt in the living room sofa, you're not going to say, oh, today is the Super Bowl. We're going to ignore that. Let's watch the, the football. And, and, and let's high five each other, you know, and scream and yell at you, you stupid, you drop a ball and cursing and you know, do all kinds of things. And then only call 911 when, when the, the smoke is become so, so intense and, and flame is up. You know, why don't you just do something at early stage? So the many people translate, as I said, you know, just observation treatment, I think it's wait and worry. It's not really not a good strategy. And the disease still kill you. It's a kill you at a much slower pace. So in, if you don't do anything at all, you get in trouble. And one of the side story I want to tell you guys, it's a God blessing of the near and society. I pick up this young kid when he was a resident at, at uh, LSU. He wanted to do some research. I said, do something with me. And he even said, well, what is that? I'm interested in pediatric oncology. I said, no, don't do that thing. You should focus on this. <laughs> this is very demand field, and you will become a like, superstar very, very quickly because no, not many people are doing this. But he has a great potential. I recognize right away. So I told, called Dr. Anthony. I said, Dr. Anthony, I'm going to send low. I'm going to send you a, a, a great kid and nurture him and, you know, he said, fine, I, I take him. So I bumped him in the hallway the one day. I say, what's your fellowship searching process going on? He said, not too good because, you know, I'm not, not getting much at all. I said, how about Lo Anthony? He said, he did not give me an invitation of, of any kind at all. And I called Dr. Anthony, I cursed him out. I said, what's wrong with you, Dr. Anthony? I sent you to the superstar, the best candidate, and you did not even consider him. 
She said, no, we sent him an e email invitation, but he never respond. Uh -huh. So now I call him. I said, what's wrong with you? I got all the effort to, 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 to line it up for a fellowship. And then he said, I really never, didn't get an email. Guess what? He, the invitation went to his spam mailbox. <laughs> and so I say, God blessing New Rankin society, because otherwise we're losing this superstar. But anyway, let me come back to the original talk here. <laughs> but anyway, so the, the thing is important. To, we need to change our mindset. You know, like young kids like this. He come up with many good ideas. We keep progressing. So one other thing he talked about, say, with primary disease, you treat it. With liver match, you treat it. Many one have a different perspective. I'm a surgeon, of course, I'm a little bit biased on the surgical intervention. And if you talk to the expert, still at this state and age, a lot of people were very reluctant to have any patient had a surgery done. Uh, given the fact surgery is much more risky, you know, on the other hand, if the success of surgery, you have, you can expect a better outcome. So this most well-known study, this is from Swedish, you know, study, they basically look at a stage four disease patient if you treat it in a different way, what the outcome is. And let me summarize for you. If you have a disease come from a, a organ, go to the lymph node, and then metastasize to the liver, and you treat do nothing, what happened? The median survival is four years. <clears throat> but if you just resect the primary, you don't do anything with the lymph node, you don't do anything with the liver, your median survival, you come up from seven, uh, four years to 7.4 years. So almost double, just by removing the primary. And then if you have surgeon do a little bit more extra work, getting the, the mesentery, Lymph node resected, now your median survival go to nine years. If you have someone do a liver resection, go all the way to the whole nine years, now your median survival become 14 years. So it tells us every single step of the way you release a disease burden, you're better off. So how could this happen? Is any, anyone else can confirm this kind of outcome? Dr. Palmier from Oregon, he looked at his data. When the d disease in liver is too, too much burden to be taken care of, he just removed the primary only and see what happened. He always show you, you have improved the minimum survival. Versus, you know, so just remove the primary, you almost triple your survival. And this is a, maybe just a small study, maybe not reliable, you look at, this is another study, this is from, from Italy. You look at it, if they just leave the tumor in the liver alone, just remove the primary, still your medium survival increase very impressively. Okay, you say, okay, that's Italy. How about some other country? This one from, from the Swedish, uh, from the England. You, so they look at it, both pancreas neuroendocrine tumor and small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, but remove the primary you almost at least triple your survival. So of course, a lot of people will argue in the national meeting, say this is not randomized trial, so this is all surgical studies. So of course, surgical studies show surgery is better. But I have to remember, like that, you know, Chohan told you, it's not ethical to just flipping a coin, say you go to surgery, you don't go to surgery. So the randomized trial is very, very difficult to conduct in our setting. Having said that, this is what I always tell my student and resident. When as a physician, a surgeon, you're treating a disease, almost like fighting a war, you must know your enemy before you can win the war. If you don't recognize your enemy, you don't know their behave, you're going to do them to fail. Now I'm going to tell you why my thinking is a little bit different, and that's why my approach is a little bit different. So this is a tumor you can see, very small primary. This, this intestine already looks purplish, and this pink, this healthy intestine, this is blood supply already got choked out by the lymph node in the mesentery. And guess how big the liver disease is? This is a liver match. Now, the, another case I'll show you this, another one, I don't know, you can see it well, very small, that's primary. This already, the intestine ready to die because the blood supply got choked out by the lymph node. 
and you look at it, this is a liver mat. It's so big, almost the size of my head. You look at another patient, this is the patient I did a beta, the third case in the beta. You see the small primary. I have my resident try to feel it three times, she, she cannot feel it. And I finally let's, say, let's, let's old man try it, and I find it. This big. Guess how much the liver match is? You will be say this is, I'm lying. No, it's the same patient. So I don't know. You already got what I'm going to. It's a very interesting disease. No other disease in human do this have this kind of behavior. The tumor usually we staging the tumor disease called called the T N N Simpson. We start from the size of the tumor, go to the lymph node, then go to the liver. That's a common side. You, you, walking up the, 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 the steps. So I'll give you an easy example. In breast cancer, the smallest breast cancer, we call T1 tumors, less than two centimeters. The reason we call it a T1 tumor because we know statistically the chance of lymph node metastasis with a small tumor like only 7%. But if you go to become a T2 tumor from two to five centimeter breast cancer, now your lymph node metastasis at least 25% now in the armpit. And you get a T3 tumor, your lymph node metastasis may be 27 or 40 percent. If you never have any lymph node in your axilla, you almost never have a tumor in your liver. So somehow this disease is a very, very different disease. It's like this tumor, primary, that's more in the small intestine. See how much disease in the lymph node, completely encasing the blood supply, and guess how much it is disease in the liver. So this is a very, very interesting disease process. In the other words, the normal disease, like breast cancer I was telling you about, your tumor needs to allow building our foundation. You need to have enough bigger tumor size to generate enough momentum to go to lymph node. When you go to lymph node, then you have a chance to mobilize to the liver. You almost had to win your way up. This disease is completely reversed. All the primary I show you is the same size of, of your fingertip. Your lymph node is, you can see from five, you know, feet away, and then your liver, you can see from five miles away, the liver metastasis. So in other words, many surgeon oncologists still treat the disease using this model they've been taught in med school. So they always address everything like this and do resection, I found that. I think this disease is like this. So if we can chop this off, this pyramid will not stand very steady. So I think the most important thing to address neuroinquine tumor is just from bottom up. So my, my, I'm very biased. I think the most important thing to treat the disease is to find the primary, knock out the primary. And I also kind of talk to my patient and my resident students say, this is almost like you're dealing with a terrorized and, and, and terrorist organization. It, it, it could, you know, Bin Laden is hiding somewhere in Afghanistan in a cave. You cannot even see it, like the small team I show you, like the fingertip. But you can see the, all the lymph node, like the training camp, it, you know, the airplane flying over, you can see it. But then the July 4th firework, you can see from anywhere. So in other words, in order to address the disease, you should have someone know what they're doing, and boots on the ground, special force, like Navy SEAL, like me, go out to kick the door, and find the primary and, and resect it. When you resect it, the other disease will be much easier to be handled. So now, this is other cancer. This is carcinoid. So that's what I think the treatment should be completely reversed. Now to treat stage four disease, there's a three components you need to look at. You need to address the primary, you need to address the lymph node, and the metastasis, you can be anywhere. It can be in the liver, can be in the bone, and can be a peritoneum. And so I'm going to address one each arm separately. So the, two, the best way to treat the primary, you ask me, say, Dr. Wang, what's the first choice? I say surgery. He said, what's the second choice? I think surgery. He said, what's the third choice? I say surgery. He said, Wang, you, you retarded. You cannot come up with any other answer. <laughs> I, I say, I'm not retarded, but I think in my mind, this is really one of the best way. But in order to do a good surgery, you must make sure you don't have left tumor behind. You need a clear margin. You should clear all the lymph node, but you also need to watch blood supply. If you kill the blood supply, the organ die, patient die, and that you don't do any good. <clears throat> so now the, the couple of things from this time on, everything I'm talking about is my 
Chinese brain somehow acting in a different way, I come up with modification. So this is a small disease like this. What we've been taught in surgery. In the past, we've been taught you have to resect five centimeters on each side. So the tumor, you, you cut the tumor upstream five centimeter, downstream five centimeter. By doing this, you should get all the tumor in fast of the organ complete out. And I bought that completely. I was a resident. The surgery tra resident training is like, like, like military. You, you say yes sir, no sir, or highway, my way or highway. If you can even argue with a professor, the professor say get out of the room. Get an our resident in here. You, you don't even get a chance to do the surgery. So we, I ne we never question. We always do that. But when I become a professor, when I teach a student resident, and the resident asks me, say, why well, I have to do five centimeters on each end? I said, that's what I've been taught. Then I finally I ask myself, say, the tumor are not person. They don't obey orders. They don't say, okay, five centimeters now, <laughs> you go, hey, come back, come back this way, you're going too far. They don't do that. They go to anywhere they want to go. So I start to doubt that question. So I start come up, maybe say we should do something to scientifically study where the tumor going. So this is what I started. You see my beautiful hand there? Yeah, and that's, that's the, the tumor I showed you earlier. Now I start the blue dot. You can see that this lymphatic is trapping. Now I can see exactly where the tumor going. Now you can see the, this uh, uh, vision. Now you can see, even see the lymph node now. This lymph node without blue stain, I may not see it. Now the next one, you see, if we've been taught five centimeter margin, I should stop here. Can you imagine all the tumor is already migrating into this area? And no wonder we have, this, if you look at all the literature, say 30% of patients with surgery with recurrent disease. I say it's a surgeon screw up. It's not because of the disease process. So now the, the thing is, I come up with the idea, say, when you have a lymph node in the mesentery and the lymphatic try to go home, they can do roadblock. You go to the second ramp on the highway, you can still block. You go to the third ramp on the highway. You keep going until just you finally find a way to home. But the problem is when the tumor tries to find a way home, it's almost a bird flying over your windshield and just poop on your windshield. All of a sudden, you get all the things. And usually, we don't address those kind of things in regular surgery, which is do the tumor out, and now you have tumor left behind. So I think that you need to be corrected. And just show you a, a few more slides, see how far this can go. Just try to impress you. The second thing is, see this is one lymph node there? I would not see that lymph node without the blue stain, but with that blue stain, I can see that very well. Yeah, yeah you have to make sure you're really close. By. Okay. So you, you can see that. The, the other thing is very important is I can even see the margin very clear now, you know. So now I can even operate with my, my first year intern unless she's called blind or she's retarded. Anyone can see that where, where the to cut, we don't have to argue. You don't need to ask you, sir, sir, why we cut here instead of there. I say, because the tumor going this route, okay? Very clear. So the other thing is, most of the tumor in, in the small bowel is close to the terminal ileum. We was taught, no question asked, tumor in the terminal ileum, you take the 10 seminal terminal ileum to get the lymphatic out completely. And again, I asked that question, I say, who says so? Remember the carcinoma patient already have a diarrhea. The ileocecal valve is a very important structure. It's a dam between the small intestine and colon. God put a damp in there to slow down to the traffic of the food going down to the small intestine, go to the colon. So give you, your body have more time to absorb the nutrient, absorb the water. So if you take the ileocecal valve without question asked, now you make a, a floodgate completely open. So patient already have diarrhea now, after surgery, they may go worse. They go home and shit like horse. And that, that's not, not, not a good thing as a surgeon. You take care of their disease, but you ruin their quality of life. So that don't do any good. So then I ask myself the question, say, can we do something to spare the thing? And turn out, yes. If the tumor come out all the way here, can take the lymphatic in the colon, I take the colon out, sacrifice the ileocecal valve there. On the other hand, if the patient like this one, the disease did not go through the, the colon, 
why should I on, on the earth I have to take the white, white cone, right? So I stopped doing that based on the blue dye. And like this patient, I did not take the cone. And I studied this and I published that as many of almost 50% of patients, we can save the idiosyncratic valve. The other thing is, I have a group of patients I have to go back to do surgery again after the initial surgery. 35 of them, 19, I find the tumor around the, 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 the old resection inside. So just tell me this blue dye thing really helps me because once we use a blue dye mapping, just know not even one had a recurrent disease. So I think the blue dye mapping means a lot of things to me, especially I insist that's an important thing to do. <clears throat> Now I'm going to address the second part of the, the, the equation. So I already talked about the primary tumor. I said you need to restrict it, use a blue dye. Now the lymph node, unfortunately most of the patients come in with a disease already in the lymph node and wrapping around the vessel. And most of the patient and surgeon look at it and say, this is too scary, I'm not going to touch it. I was a resident, I was trained to say, if you have a disease wrapping around your vessel, don't even touch it because you're going to hurt the patient. That's called forbidden surgery. And, but I had the first three patients, I failed to, to address that issue, all three died. One of the patients, the husband, uh, talked to me afterwards. She's from the Virginia area. She, he looked at me, he said, Dr. Wang, thank you so much for trying to save my wife. I really did not do anything. I open up, I see all the lymph nodes wrapping around the vessel. I close up, like I've been taught. She unfortunately passed away in, in the hospital two weeks after surgery. She was in so much pain, we put a morphine drip, cannot control the pain. So the husband be become a good friend with me because I'm a very caring physician. I would go to hospital seeing her four or five times a day, try to do everything I could. I literally camp out in the hospital for her. So the husband looked at me and said, Dr. Wang, I wish you had the nerve, had the ball to, to give a shot that day. I said, what do you mean? He said, I wish you tried that day try to see why you can remove all the tumor out. And, and she, I prefer she died on the table. At least she would, would not be miserable for the, for the next two weeks and suffer like that. And, she's, and he said, maybe at that day you will try, maybe she's still alive. So that's all of a sudden changed my perspective completely. As a physician, we never thought from a person's perspective, we've been taught to do what you've been, you've been trained to do. So we assuming what I want is what you want. You understand what I'm saying? So I never even have a thought, say the patient, they have their own agenda, have their own wish. So that, that husband really liked me. He said, I wish you have the nerve to give it a try. She, he said very clearly, he said, I prefer she died that day on the table. But at least she had a chance to survive and instead of die miserably. So, Wow, I went home, I had really put this in thought, say, wow, this is a very profound. I have to really t do some soul searching. The second patient came in. I say, okay, I remember the first pain. So I do a little bit more aggressive, do a little bit more, and then the intestine turn, start turning purple. So I go get cold feet. I say, I'm going to come out. So I did not finish up again. I come out. Again, she passed away, didn't have a good outcome. And the family tell me exactly the same thing. She, the family say, I wish you just give a shot that day. So from that time on, I say, I have to do something. I did change my mindset. So I start to say, I'm going to try the aggressive lymphatic, uh, lymph node dissection. And I show you some uh, good, good example. So like this patient, you can see all the lymph node wrapping around the vessel. And I can show you the CT scan. You can see the CT scan show the blood supply in here. And that's a tumor lump around it. My radiology even marker for you. You can see the tumor there. <coughs> And I give a shot, you can see the vein very clearly coming out. And just how much tumor I get out on that patient, it take me eight to 10 hours to, to get this done. Um, now you can look at this patient, another patient, she was sitting home for 15 years. Now you, you look and see what, what I see. See the small Bin Laden I was telling you? That's primary tumor, that's so small, no one even can see. And she had all kind of study, endoscopy, anything, no one can find the thing. I see how much tumor I got out on the same patient. So now, from this time on, I'm moving forward. I get a lot of 
of patient referral, just all of some same disease. This patient, does it, uh, you can see the vessel, go back. You can see the vessel, this is the portal vein, this is aorta, this is SMA, come out to the intestine. I basically did it like open book, the tumor is covering the whole side, I flip over that first. And then I move on to clean up, by the time I'm done, almost as someone take the gloves off. So I started to do this kind of thing, and, and I showed this in the AAES meeting, and uh, it's a German surgeon, Italian surgeon, and a French surgeon to kind of stand up, salute me, and say, Dr. Wang, that's a, it's, a, it's a real beautiful dissection you did. And the French surgeon said, he must have a high testosterone level. <laughs> so this is a you know, couple of patients, you can see the tumor wrapping around the vessel, and no one won't try. And, uh, I got a shot, I give them a shot, I got cleaned out. And this is a few other case example, and this is usually what I do. I just spend all day long in the operating room, get all the tumor out, and usually it's, it's, this is what I do. So the only thing I did is, after I remove all the tumor very clearly, and I think that must be some disease microscopically sitting in that area. I just cannot see with my eyes yet. I said, what can I do to prevent disease from coming back? Because all the literature say about 30% of patients will have recurrent disease. So I thought about maybe something I can do. What happened is, I started thinking, say, when I take the tumor out, I'm going to take the tumor back to the research lab, have my, my research you know, assistant and the resident cut the tumor up then we really grow the tumor in the research lab. And then when the tumor start growing in the research lab in the petri dishes, we put different kind of chemotherapy into the petri dishes to see which chemotherapy will kill the tumor. I think that's the best way to, to learn directly, see which chemotherapy will work, which will not. So with this, I studied, <clears throat> the first study, I smiled, I was a, a man, he just left. We, we reported this about 69% of patients tumor will respond to 5-FU. We did another study, the second study is 91% of patients with tumor respond to 5-FU. So all of a sudden I say, ha-ha, I have an answer now for this particular question. I say, after I dissect the tumor out, there's a cavity there, you can see the vessel, I'm gonna put something in there. What I do is, I know the 5-FU will work, right? The first study, about 70% of patients, the second study showed 93% of patients. <clears throat> this is a resolvable sponge, surgical sponge. You can soak into the chemotherapy agent you can put into there. And this sponge will dissolve away in, the, in about six weeks to, to eight weeks without the chemotherapy. With the chemotherapy, it stays even longer. Then I can have the student resin sew this back up together. And I clearly call it Chinese dumpling because I want to give myself a little bit credit, I'm a Chinese, and just almost like make a dumpling, right? <laughs> now I have the steel and sew back together, like, you know, sew the, the, the dough back together. So I did that, so I present, because I'm the first one in the whole world did this, I want to get the first credit. The, the scientific area in medical sciences, whoever published first got the name on that thing. So I, I have a 60s, Two patients already, I said, Let, let's do this. So we presented in the 2012 Surgical Society Oncology meeting. And we was very honest. We tell the audience, the five-year survival are no difference. Okay, with without Chinese dumping, they do the same thing. But there's a big difference. About the 62 patients, 32 Versus 30, without dumpling, I have 16 of the, the patient, 30 of the, the patient without dumpling, I would take them to the operating room. With the Chinese dumpling, six of the 32, I have to take a major surgery. So in other words, somehow the Chinese dumpling prevent me need going back to do another surgery. That means they had much local, less local disease. The amazing thing is that six, this six patients, I take them back to the operating room. Two, I find tumors in the resection bed where I'm busting around. In this group of patients, 16 patients, I have to take them back. Nine of the 16, I find the tumor still left behind. So I put these two numbers together. Is, is two of the 32 with a disease, nine of the 30 
with disease. So in other words, Chinese dumpling prevents the local recurrence from 30% to 6.25%. I think that was, was, was something to be excited. And I was standing on podium, I was uh, hoping to, to, to receive a standing ovation. <laughs> and then one of the surgeons came to the microphone and said, Isan, that's an impressive number, but don't mean shit to me. I, I, I said, excuse me, what do you, why you say that? He said, we are cancer surgeons, so we are looking for five-year survival. And you tell me the five-year survival, no difference. So in other words, you just a fancy footwork did not mean any worse. So my resident almost cried. Man, I was so excited. You know, I was thinking I'm getting a, 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 some kind of award. I said, yes, let's go back and do more work. So we went home, getting more patient. And then we, we went back. And now this time we show the dumpling with and without making 80 mo 88 months difference. So now it's a seven years difference now, right? Yeah, and, and I, I told my, my resident, say, if that guy ever talked to you, tell him to go, go home and eat his shit. <laughs> All right, so that's the thing. So now I'm coming back into the liver match itself. When you have a liver metastasis with neuroenquine tumor go to the liver, you really have to take many things into a consideration. Before all the other treatment, before affinity or CAP-10, before PRT become available, really the, the choice is not as many. So you only have a blind embolization, radial embolization, surgery, so on and so forth. Right now, this, this game changed quite a bit now. In the past, I recommend almost everyone, you need to consider surgery more. Now I have a little bit more reserve now because there's different options now. The thing is, the most important thing you need to look at is see what the disease pattern is. And like this first patient I show you, there's only a few dominated mass. Those patients are much easier, decision making wise. If they are healthy enough, low grade tumor, find a good surgeon, resect it, you put this behind you and just follow up very closely, okay? If on the other hand, you have a patient like this, the surgery is really not a good choice. Just no way a surgeon can spend there, you know, three days to you know, chip out everything. Patient not gonna do well, the liver not gonna survive. You're gonna have a trouble. On the other hand, if you have one other patient like this, your combination, the big lumps, big lumps, but the small lumps, small lumps, small lumps, lumps I think that the treatment choice, I will have surgery to remove the big lumps and then have radiology to treat the small lumps. Okay. So this is a very important thing to, to remember. So now, as I said, you can have resection, you can have enucleation, you can do a liver transplant, you can have ablation combined with surgery or have IR staff to do that for you. You can do the hormone therapy, you can put a PRT, you can put a taste, you know, and uh, it's toxic chemotherapy, affinator, immuno checkpoint. There's so many different choices. So that's why I think it's very important when you have a disease, the whole process, everything have to take into account. Your general health condition, your nutritional status, are you anemic or not? How many disease involved in how many different organs? What your functioning status? And what your local facility expertise. And the other thing is all those treatments are not mutually exclusive. Maybe you are playing the car. You put out this car first and then the other car next and the third car. My recommendation, if you have a dominant disease, of course, you are young and healthy, the first car I will put is surgery. And then if disease come back, you consider hormonal therapy, send us and an affinator, you put on cap tan, and you know, if the disease migrate to the bone, migrate to the lung, and you know, do anywhere else, maybe at that time PRT would be a good choice. So if every patient you have with, with a different condition, and some people, the disease is so big, the surgery may, may not be too safe, you maybe have a radiologist to, to Amplifies that the tumor, shrink the tumor to make surgery safer and easier. That's maybe another option. So in other words, in, when the disease goes to the liver, it's no longer a straightforward decision-making process. You really need a group of good doctors sit down together 
and to go through to evaluate all the strategies. And most of the time, we will end up, you will need more, more than one car to deal with the problem. You just don't know which car did you put out first. You follow what I'm saying? In, in my book, is if you're a young, healthy, low-grade tumor, dominant disease, disease limit to the, to the liver, surgery, I think, is a, the best choice as the first one. Because then, because the surgery buys you the most of the time. Remember, I showed you the first slide. One good surgery will give you 15, 14 years, lifetime, longevity-wise. Then you can use a phenotype to buy another five years. You can use Captain to buy another three years. You can a PRT to buy another five years. Hey, if you are 60, by doing this, you won't be 95. <laughs> you know, and that's good enough. So in other words, on the other hand, if you are already 85 and you're not very healthy, and you say, I'm going to do the surgery first, if surgery don't work out and you died from surgery complication, that don't mean do any good. So in those patients, I may never even recommend surgery. Maybe you use a PRT first, if you have multiple organ disease. If you have less limited disease, maybe try captain first, you know, or you can use a phenotype. So what I'm saying is when you have a disease go to there, it's very, very complicated. Now, if you had to go to surgery, then I'm also in the, on the other camp of the, the, the equation. Knowing the disease process, they are coming back so easily and so rampantly, and, and they can come back. No one can predict where they come back, how bad they come back with. So I try to preserve as much liver tissue as possible. So I don't do any form of resection. I don't do a, a lobectomy. I don't do anything. I basically just take the tumor out where the tumor is. I don't do anything else. And I, I call it non-anatomic resection. I'm not found anatomy. I'm not saying you must do the right lobe, you must do the just one segment or the next segment. Basically, I just enucleate. And then if the tumor on the side, I need to enhance my treatment, I use ablation technique at the same time. Now, this patient I show you, he has all the tumor in there, there, and I show you this already, the big tumor, big tumor. So he also have the disease in wrapping out of the messenger, so the bowel is not healthy. So I take him back, I resect all the tumor out. And this patient have all the surgery without even blood transfusion, went home five days. Um, and I just want to impress you, this thing is bigger than my head, literally. And I did not sacrifice any healthy liver at all. This is another patient come from San Diego. He went to the, the very three big names cancer center with this disease. He sees the whole right side of the liver completely occupied by the tumor. Look at how big the thing is. Then the reason they reject him because you see the portal vein go right to into it. They say, if we try to resect it, you're going to bleed to death on the table. So he finally he came in. He said, can you do something? I said, I cannot promise, but I promise I will do my best, give it a shot. And many people here, I operate on you heard this before. I say, I never promise anything, but I give a shot. And most of the time, God's on my side, 98% of the time. <clears throat> and um, so I did, did well on him at the tumor. Somehow, I forgot to put in there. But anyway, trust me, that thing will come out without blood transfusion, too. And these are neuroinquine people in, in, in the pancreas result. Oh, this tumor here. That's the tumor I was showing you. It come out very nicely without blood transfusion. Now, last time, last thing I want to address a little bit. People talk about to be your own advocate and keep telling your physician what you think your problem is. Communication is most important. And this is a lifetime story I learned from my patient. And Bob, you guys heard me talk about this story many times because it's so cute. This patient got operated on by a very big name cancer center. And he just think the surgeon missed up something. So he came to, to, to see me in my office with all the studies and just dropped on my desk, say, please help me. I said, what can I do for, sir? He said, my surgeon missed up something. I said, oh, don't, don't say that. Don't jump in the conclusion. Let me read the report. So I read the surgeon's note, the pathology report. I look at him, I say, no, your surgeon did a perfect job. Your surgeon is very detailed, meticulous. Even the dictation, line by line, everything he had done, all lined up very nicely. He said, no, uh, there's something wrong. And I thought he's crazy. I want to want to send him out the door. 
and uh, my student resident all standing behind me. I say, I need to be a good example. I need to be patient. So I asked him, say, why do you think your surgeon is doing something, did something wrong? He said, I'm no longer having sex with my wife. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You come to the wrong clinic. I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I, I don't know why you don't have sex with your wife. You come to the wrong place. And he insists, no, I have something wrong. My surgeon missed something. Please fix me. Everyone on the, on the internet, Facebook, say, you are, the, you are the guy to fix my problem. I say, that's a problem on Facebook. They always tell you something wrong. I say, I'm not that good. I, I cannot help you. He said, I'm not going home. I spent $12,000 air, airline ticket. I'm going to get some answer. So I finally called Dr. Campbell from nuclear medicine. I said, Richard, just scan him. I think this guy's nuts. Just get, get a scan. I tell him, so you're all in your head. You are normal study. Go on. The Richard did a study and called me and said, isn't there something there? I said, shit, damn. <laughs> so I now I call the patient back. I said, I'm so sorry. I doubt you. There's something there. Maybe we can try to fix it. So I take it back to the operating room. I open it, I cannot find the thing. I cannot find a thing. For three hours, I got so frustrated. I said, damn, Richard, you ambushed me. You must have did a wrong study. Now I'm stuck in the operating room now. And my resident was so bored, she had the, the, the Geiger counter in hand, like waving. And the machine, like, be, be, like, synchronized with, she's waving. And I said, must be some tumor in there that uh, the scanner goes through the ground area, it beep. So finally I said, oh my God, I know what the patient has. She must have a tumor in the testicle. And I just read a paper from, from the night before. There's one report, there's someone with a tumor in the testicle. So I close up the abdomen, I pull the testicles out, do a hernia incision, and I see the thing. You guys know the anatomy? This is the vast difference, this is where the sperm go through when you ejaculate, you see the tumor there, here are three tumors wrapping around it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've done a lot of patient check, right, post-op check. This is the most amazing post-op check I ever had in my lifetime. You literally can see he smiles three miles away. <laughs> he come in, he give me a hug, so, so, so tight, almost, almost choked me. And, and then I, I tell my medical student, say, if you, Ask him, does he believe in God? And he will say yes, and he's a Chinese. <laughs> and this is what I told my student resident in the operating room. I said, do what is necessary first, then do what is possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. And this is my quote. Thank you so much.